This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian, Miss Berlin, and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. Hello. Hi. Hey. So isn't it like Christmas today, everybody? For you? Um, <laughs> it's like Christmas in May. I love it. So well, you got you got gifts. Yes, Free I gifts. did. I melted my card today. Uh, May 1st is when all the training and the tickets and the things happened for DerbyCon. Um, actually, what was it? Saturday. Uh, they, they, I happened to be in the supermarket with my wife and she was getting yogurt and I checked my Twitter and it's like, oh yeah, we're releasing like a hundred tickets. I'm like, boom. So I bought three tickets for DerbyCon. Um, and then, you know, I was going to get some training. So I, you know, this morning I, you know, refreshed the page like everyone else did and hit the training. So I'm going to, I'm going to be with, um, was it Josh Schwartz, Fuzzy Knop? I'm going to do the red teaming uh, class at DerbyCon. So that's a good thing. And then I uh, bought my hotel, airfare and, and whatever. So um, we're going to be at DerbyCon, and I have a ticket. At least we're going to give away one ticket for free for DerbyCon this year. So we're going to have to start working on our CTF. Yes. So uh, that'll be I a planning wait. meeting. So Planning meeting. Planning okay. meeting. Cool. Yes. yes. Can't wait to work on it. I have a bunch of good ideas. Yeah, me too. Mr. Betcher's got some too, I hope. Uh-huh. Wait, what's that? Hacks? What's hacks? H-A-X. Oh, oh it's, the, it's the DerbyCon ticket. It uh, took so- a minute. Sorry, it's a Derby okay. sticker from last year. It's okay, it's light <clears throat> yeah. over there in Seattle. Yep. So uh, five yeah. o'clock in the afternoon. That's right. It was. Uh, yeah, no, it was a good day. Uh, it's yeah, you know, it's seven o'clock. It's past my bedtime, six thirty. So MacGyver's off. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, um, so uh, Mr. Betcher, myself, and Miss Berlin will be at DerbyCon. Uh, you know, whether or not we're speaking, uh, we'll we'll definitely be doing training. Me and Mr. Betcher, and then Miss Amanda will get a talks submitted and approved i'm sure of it so uh yeah so we'll all be there we'll have to do a meetup or something yeah yep <clears throat> anyway um we're not here to talk about DerbyCon. con uh, i'm sorry if you didn't get tickets but uh, if you keep listening uh in the in the coming month or two you'll uh, you'll get the chance to win so uh this week we are kind of building upon other podcasts that we've done. We did a we did a show on uh, 2FA and multi-factor auth. Uh, we did a show with Jason Garbus on software-defined perimeter. Uh, we've done a couple of shows with um, uh, Paul Coggin on software-defined networking. Uh, it's apparently the end of times. Software-defined networking is the end of times. Uh, but this uh, week, we are actually adding on to the uh, software-defined perimeter by interviewing two gentlemen by the name of Evan Gilman and Doug Barth. Uh, it, it is Barth, right? It is, yeah. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Challenge That's a lot. rarity. Hey, come on, man. <laughs> anyway, so um, Evan, uh, Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. So um, I'll start with Evan. Uh, maybe you could introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about where you, uh, how you got to where you are and what you do um, in, in InfoSec or IT. Yeah. So um, as you said, my name is Evan and I, you know, I'm originally, uh, my background is network engineering um, in academia. So I came from higher education, working on kind of, you know, large open research networks. Um, and, you know, found myself in an opportunity to kind of switch gears a little bit and go into, you know, more traditional like ops, that's uh, kind of role here um, in San Francisco Bay Area with a company called PagerDuty. Um, so I worked there for a number of years. Um, and while working there, uh, <clears throat> you know, had a, a, some unique network challenges and requirements that needed to be met and built out a lot of automation to solve some hard security problems in the face of, if you will, like cross-cloud um, kind of infrastructure. So PagerDB had deployments, you know, many, many different providers uh, across open internet with like quorum-based systems operating over those links. And so there's a lot of interesting kind of uh, challenges that arise in that sort of architecture. And um, so I, I worked on solving some of those problems there for a number of years. And uh, that's actually where I met Doug. Um, and now uh, have, have most recently actually departed PagerDuty to focus full time on on this problem uh, that we're about to discuss today called Zero Trust. Cool. And um, go. Uh, oh God. Um, wait. 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 Doug. 
Doug. Yeah. Doug, yes, Doug Barth. I, sorry, I had to go back. Uh, <laughs> I have the memory of a goldfish. I, I only picked Evan first because his name is first in the book. So, like, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and we'll, we'll get to the book. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But, uh, Doug, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, how you got to where you are, you know, your superhero origin story. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, um, Doug, I am an SRE now at Stripe. Um, working on a team that they call delivery, which is just a very nice term for like the team that gets all the odds and ends of Stripe. Mm. Um, so I deal a lot today with um, deployment systems, uh, network architecture, security systems, <laughs> um, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but my actual like original background is I've been a developer my entire professional life. Um, started way back when at a, a company called Orbitz, um, doing like Java development. And over the course of my career, went from like a large company there where you had someone else managing your infrastructure to a small startup where that was all my responsibility to then PagerDuty where I was dealing with PagerDuty's um, infrastructure. And, you know, just really liking um, leveraging my like developer experience to kind of take away a lot of the pain of running infrastructure and actually kind of treat it as a large distributed system that we could uh, do some really interesting things with. Nice. Very nice. All right. So the the reason we had you on is one of my uh, one of our mutual colleagues. His name is uh, Nick uh, Nick G, as I affectionately call him. Uh, emailed me and said, "Hey, you know these these guys. Uh, you know he he said, hey, love your show. Mr. Betcher is very nice. Maybe you should have these two guys on. They're talking about zero trust network." And I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." So um, you're you're writing a book for uh, O'Reilly, much like Miss Miss Amanda did and Mr. Mr. Brotherston did for the for the um, you know, release and you're it's currently in pre-order. You can pre-order up to I think I I have just downloaded it prior to the show starting here and you're you the first seven chapters looks like have been sent out. Um, what made you guys want to buy uh, uh, write this book in the first place? Sure. Um, so the way this kind of happened is interesting. So when we were at uh, PagerDuty, you know, we're building these systems that have to run like um, critical and sensitive data over the internet constantly. And so that kind of affected how we built the, the network architecture of the system. And so we did a lot of uh, fun stuff there with uh, configuration management systems and automation to more or less abstract away the particulars of the network and treat it as like um, kind of like a virtualized network, but avoiding running just an overlay network on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we built all that tech. Um, we thought it was neat. We started talking at uh, industry conferences like um, O'Reilly's Velocity Conference, uh, DevOps Days, things like that, and uh, kind of built this model of like, how do you build a system that doesn't trust the network? And what we found is when we would give these talks, people would say, oh, this is really neat. Where do I learn more about it? And we'd go, well, you have to come talk to me and we'll, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what I know right now. But like, there was nothing that you could just concretely point to and be like, here's how you build a network where you don't have like traditional perimeter systems. Sure. And so that got a discussion started with O'Reilly on maybe there's an opportunity here to like capture um, this idea because as we learned more about it, a lot of companies are actually doing this, but they haven't really been a completely like public and um, obvious in the way they're doing it. I'd say mm -hmm. the one company that has done that is Google and they've gotten a lot of uh, press and interest, but there are other companies out there that are doing that. So yeah. that's how we got started on it. Very cool. <clears throat> so did you build that network from scratch at PagerDuty? Yeah, um, pretty much. <laughs> uh, pr prior prior like uh, to the existence of that kind of a network at PagerDuty, um, everything was kind of wired up by hand on a case by case basis. The infrastructure is still very small, um, mm -hmm. and we had um, and we had like this very like probably one of the largest drivers is that you know we had this disparate interface for security controls. Some providers uh, like AWS provided security groups. Some didn't have any kind of analog to the, that sort of thing. Uh, so we were kind of forced to come up with, you know, a common abstraction for those things and a software way to implement the enforcement policies, which we would prefer to enforce, regardless of what provider uh, the compute resource was in. So um, a lot of the stuff was all built in-house and custom grown and just kind of evolved over time um, through our experiences operating it. And, and there is, you know, um, which we can talk about later, a bit of an evolution story on kind of how, how that network evolved and, and, and came to kind of grow its chops, so to speak. Okay. So at the time, at the time, did you know Google was doing it when you started? 
I don't think Google was public until 2014 when they did their first okay. Encore paper. Uh, but it was kind of neat when that came out because, you know, some of the ideas that we were sitting there thinking about, like, how do you start from the assumption that someone malicious is on your network and work your way backwards towards security was a lot of what Google was talking about with their own um, security mm-hmm. or network security architecture. Yeah. So we uh, we had Jason Garbus on who was on the steering committee for the Cloud Security Alliance's um, standards for software defined perimeter. How does zero trust networking and zero define uh, software defined perimeter um, are, are how are they the same and how are they different? Or are they the, just different implementations of the same thing, or um, is it just fancy marketing calling it zero trust? Sure. So I'll take that one. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> you know we, we Doug and I have been closely following the um, SDP software defined perimeter standard set uh, for quite some time now. Um, we came across it in early research and in, in, in doing our book, and we've been following the, the development of it, and, and we really like the work that's going on there. Um, our viewpoint of you know zero trust versus SDP, so to speak, is that you know zero trust is a model, it's an architectural model, it's a set of philosophies by which you build a system against. Um, I would I would label SDP as um, you know a, a software implementation of a facet of the zero trust architecture. Um, so I, I believe that SDP is a zero trust technology. Um, I think that you know it, it solves probably some of the largest problems that, that we have that zero trust that we can throw zero trust at today, which is the client facing systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a whole other story for systems living inside the data center um, across data center boundaries and things like that. So um, I think we look at zero at, at SDP as you know def, a definite component of, of zero trust and, and something which implements uh, the zero trust model. Um, but is is kind of you know a slice of the pie um, in the larger picture. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> how does a mature company who already have their own traditional network just decide tomorrow morning? Hey, let's do zero trust because obviously that's not going to happen, and in many cases it may be impossible. You guys mentioned you you mentioned implementing this at, at PagerDuty, I believe, which is a fairly small company, very right. not complicated network. How would a company say, I don't know, with a couple thousand people who've been around for about 10 years, already got an established network, how do they create, how do they use this instead of, you know, the traditional like VPN or whatever that they use? Sure. Uh, so I think what's kind of interesting about that is like, um, if you think about Google as like the company that's leading the way here, they obviously have a, a giant network, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so they talked about how they transitioned to that and uh, what's kind of shocking about their Beyond Core paper is like how just kind of straightforward it is. You end up, you know, logging all your traffic, you start categorizing it, you do simulations. You just try to figure out, well, how do I like slowly gain some confidence that this, um, all this policy and security controls that I want to put in place aren't actually going to start breaking things. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say most companies or a, a company that wanted to start transitioning away from a perimeter model to um, a zero trust model, probably try to do it uh, on like kind of their their most core data asset and, you know, start in the small and build out in their network. Um, it's really kind of depends on what you're, what you're worried about. Like Google somewhat interestingly, like they started from what might be a harder problem, which is I have all these remote endpoints that I don't even trust that, their access to the VPN is enough for me to, to say with certainty that there's no one malicious in there. Mm-hmm. And so they took on like that chance, but they still put like a separation, right? They still have an access proxy that is receiving client connections, doing authorization and, and really deep checks and then proxying it through to a, a backend network, which probably looks more traditional than the, you know, the internet facing side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell us what it is in a nutshell. Um, I, I, Doug's favorite way to describe it is, is you know, simply you build systems with the assumption that the host in your infrastructure next to you is already owned and your network is already owned. Um, and how do you go about constructing security systems and distributed systems in a way um, which takes those considerations in and, and uh, kind of limits the impact and damage of an attacker on any given node in the infrastructure, right? Um, and particularly like uh, with network capabilities as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think kind of the crux of it is, you know, most people 
when you build an infrastructure, you start with a perimeter and you lay this line down and you say, okay, everything behind this thing is kind of safe. And then you build a bunch of value back there, a bunch of services and other things. Um, and then eventually you kind of circle back around and say like, oh, wait, now like you have this major lateral movement problem and all these other things, right? So the zero trust model kind of says, you know what, like time and time again, we have seen that when you say this section of the network is trusted, um, leads to very unhealthy behavior and very uh, poor security systems design. Um, so rather than that, we just put the basis down and say, look, you don't trust the network at all. Um, and when you design the systems, you design it such that there is no such thing as behind the firewall or anything like that. The hosts need to be instrumented with identity. Um, the, the endpoints that you're communicating should be to directly authenticate each other and authorize each other um, and, and a lot of things like that. So it's removing kind of a lot of these security functionalities from the network and, and there's no more such thing as, as you know, trust interface and untrust interface, so to speak. Um, so uh, instead, you rely on on just rigorous identity authentication and authorization through the use of like automation and, and other things. Okay, so it's a largely a flat network, then, right? Um, I, I mean, think- if if you're telling me that no one trusts anyone, then all the nodes are pretty much the same, and they all have their own rule set applied to them, right? Absolutely, yeah. And and it depends on how you use the word flat. You know, so I'm I'm coming from a network background, and when I hear flat network, I think of like you know giant layer two you know broadcast domains, right? And and the kind of the nice thing about zero trust is that um, it doesn't really rely on any kind of underlying network architecture. If the endpoints can reach each other. Um, and they can do cryptographic negotiation uh, uh, through the, that reachability and, and also protect those links. Um, so it, it's not necessarily, um, you know, a large flat layer two network. It's more kind of like lifting lifting the topological concerns out of the network and saying, I'm a host, you're a host, I can send you packets, I can receive your packets. How can I ensure that you are the person, that, in fact, that I think that you are and that the request you're trying to make is actually authorized? Yeah. So... This model seems to run kind of counter to how we do things normally these days where we don't trust the client coming in, where now it's like you're not trusting the server you're connecting to. Uh, and and, and in, in the other cases, the server isn't trusting the client either in the, in, the, in the more traditional sense. But it's like nobody's trusting anybody, which is why we're having zero trust. But um, – <clears throat> How do you build We're the trust? Having, we have zero. We have zero trust now without the design of the. Actual yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> as security people, we don't we don't trust the the clients who are coming in because they're not patching their stuff. You know, most most companies don't have an MDM solution. You know, for for mobile devices, how do you build trust in a no trust network? I think there's two things. Um, the way I think about it is that uh, you know there's the enforcement piece, right? Should I trust a, a client coming in? Um, but there's also like the heavy monitoring of that internal network. Um, so even though we're talking about like, okay, these two endpoints can like cryptographically start communicating with each other in a way that we think is pretty trusted, uh, a zero trust network like beyond core will still like analyze that traffic for anomalies and try to figure out if someone is leveraging credentials to do something malicious in the network. Mm-hmm. Um, so you end up almost with like kind of three people watching each other, making sure they're doing the right thing. Um, okay. And to add to that a little bit, it, it's kind of like, you know, the, the things which are, quote, trusted, like your servers or your users or, or whatever it is, right? Um, you don't install total trust in them. You install some amount of trust, right? So I trust, I, I pretty much trust that you, that you are an authentic user, and I pretty much trust that this is an authentic device. Um, and the authorization comes from a union of those things. Um, considering the trust in aggregate and saying, okay, well, this is like what I'm pretty sure is an authorized user coming from what I am pretty sure is an authorized device accessing a resource, which I am pretty sure is one that they would normally access. Therefore, we can say with a fairly high degree of confidence, this is probably an authorized action. So, so a bunch of pretty sure's equal okay. <laughs> it's essentially it's essentially the same as like multi-factor authentication, if you think about it. Um, it's like saying, look, you have the password and you have this token and maybe you have another key. Those things together give me a boosted degree of confidence to say, all right, this is probably what I think it actually is, right? Yeah. And zero trust networks take that in, in, into account. And one of the cornerstones is that you should never authorize only a device or only a user or only an application. It should be those things in, in, in junction together. Okay. What do you use as this third party uh, tool, right? To say, oh, you know, X wants to communicate with Y. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll let them because I think that's allowed. And 
it doesn't look like it's suspicious in any way and and uh, probabilistically it looks okay right yeah what what what's what's there in the middle yeah so i think right now the the fact is that in these types of networks it's custom software um and that's something that needs to improve in order for this model to to go out into the industry more uh, but there's somewhere in the system exists like what we would call like a policy engine that is taking in requests that it needs to authorize, checking them against uh, sources of truth that it's scraped out of the either the network activity or like say scans of a device or a, um, a user database and just making that determination. And then kind of the neat thing that you see in these types of networks is there's often like kind of this uh, split between um, who defines policy. Um, so you might say like individual services, let's say your company is running like a wiki and it wants to offer it to uh, mobile users. You might let the, the team that actually runs the wiki set some portion of the policy, but you might also have like an infrastructure group that's setting like base rules for policy. And it's like the union of those two policies defines whether or not someone gets access. So and that policy engine is responsible for like kind of cheering through all that and making the final determination at that point in time, do I allow this access? That may be different later based on how that user behaves. So, and what did you build that policy engine with in the, in the past? So, um, Java. Such, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> did you write a Java app? I know, Doug. You uh, you said you were a Java developer. I used to be a Java developer. Now I don't do Java anymore. He got that. Yeah. He got, he got you that. You were. I were. I was. Yes. So this is this is kind of you know touching on an interesting point. Is is that you know there's lots of different. Um, stages of evolution or, or mat maturity of a zero trust network, you know, um, you can have some that are, are relatively primitive and you can have some which are considered advanced. Um, the, the key kind of, of goal of a zero trust network goes to distrust the network or not or, or remove whatever trust exists in the network already, whether it be by trusting a particular source IP address or, or what have you. Um, so as long as you meet those requirements, that, that's kind of the model, right? Um, and so, so you can meet those requirements in kind of a bare bones way. Um, and you then and, and once you meet that, that's kind of like the first step or foray in, into adopting the model. And then the things can evolve under all these interesting attachment points and other ways that you can extend those those enforcement components. So the networks that Doug and I um, worked on at PagerDuty, uh, the way that this was done is that the policy was encoded in the configuration management systems. And configuration management systems also um, performed what we called device inventory responsibility. Um, so it was aware, the, our configuration management service is aware of what posts are in the infrastructure, what their roles are, what the responsibilities are, is also aware of what kind of policies might be attached to those particular roles. Um, role X is allowed to be accessed by role Y on port you know, A, B, or C, or whatever it is. Um, and configuration management um, is smart enough to go out there, do those queries, figure out what's allowed, and wire things up dynamically. So as the topology changed, um, you know, we would see those, those policies get pushed out and changed uh, in the actual kind of enforcement layers. So to speak, and that's just could be basic ID tables, right? ID set configuration um, and things like that. Uh, so, so, so at PagerDuty, that's how we solved that particular problem. Um, and as the, as the zero trust network matures and even at PagerDuty, we started, you know, scooping pieces of those functionalities out into dedicated services and out of configuration management. Um, and then you start to see dedicated services which can take in kind of generalized policy about workloads and then crunch them against real-time updates from these various inventory databases. So, so as you can see, um, it, it can go from kind of very basic, just really easy, hey, we wrote it over the weekend in Chef, uh, all the way up to like, you know, a myriad of dedicated uh, backend services which power these dynamic authorization decisions. Mm. I think like the key thing to get comfortable with there is the, the idea that your network is not going to be defined by you um, configuring individual, say like subnets mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, you know, port ranges, right? It's, it's going to be like captured what I like to call like symbolically. So you're saying like this app is, or this client is talking to this app on this port and here's the meaning behind this. And then you're just going to let like the machinery actually reprogram the network. Mm. <clears throat> All right. So, let's say I have a traditional application where I have a web front end, I have an application middle layer, and I have a database back end, and I'm processing e-commerce stuff. All of a sudden, my CIO comes in and says, hey, I saw this in CIO Monthly called Zero Trust Networks. Let's do that. How would somebody take a traditional three-layer application with proper segmentation and maybe you're doing a little PCI going on here and just all of a sudden turn it into a Zero Trust Network? 
Yeah, you go first. <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> is what that means. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, like like you know, we mentioned earlier, Doug and I kind of built this stuff from scratch. Most of the people uh, that we talked to today who, who have built networks like this have built from scratch. Um, we all are kind of surprised to run into each other and we say, hey, we've been building stuff kind of the same way. And then you talk about, you know, the ways you've done it, but but there is no common solution, unfortunately. Mm. Um, you know, the, the building blocks are common, right? You can use IPsec as, as there. You can use TLS, right? You can use IP tables. You can use Berkeley Packet Filter. You can use Windows R, whatever. Like those building block, fundamental building blocks are there. Um, so what's really required is kind of the glue between them and really just the, the automation glue. Um, I think one of the largest requirements is that you have to have some idea of what's running, um, which means you need to, like a device inventory and, and, you, and you, need, you need a database which is documenting the workloads and the policies attached to them. Um, so that's probably the first step. If you, if you have an infrastructure in which there is no centralized source of truth for what is running, start there for sure. Okay. Um, and then the next step I would say is, is like, like we did a, a pager duty, you know, we kind of took it one step at a time when we started building this stuff into admittedly very heavyweight configuration automation. Um, you know, but, but that kind of gets your, your toe in the water. Um, and once you kind of have that going, you can see up the value and then start dedicating time to scooping those things out and evolving them in, in, into larger things. But again, like I do think it currently, unfortunately, um, it is kind of largely roll your own. Yeah. So Evan was so brave to do that first. Like the thought that's running through my mind is I work with someone who says in our security team who says his job is basically to go around and say the word threat model a lot. Yeah. And I would say that's where you like start, right? Is what are you most worried about and what are the assets people are going after? And then kind of work your way backwards on what's the, you know, the first um, improvement I can do uh, to the system. Yeah. I mean, a lot of ways like this isn't like, it's not magic sauce, right? This is just well applied like security um, practices um, under the assumption that someone malicious is sitting there on the network. Sure. So, Miss Amanda, you've been fairly quiet. Do you have any thoughts or questions? I know this a is a lot. Yeah. Please, <clears throat> so, please don't hesitate to jump in. We're not, you know. <laughs> well, I was choking there for a minute. I I had to mute. Um, <clears throat> That's what happens when you inhale what you're drinking. Um, yeah, especially if it's uh, bubbly and alcoholic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That too. Um, uh, the one question I had was, um, how have you have you seen anybody do this when you have BYOD? Like, does that does that go in? You know, you have to know what you're running and, right. and what devices you have. And I, I know a lot of people struggle a lot with not only asset management, but knowing what software is even running on their network. Um, I didn't know if like BYOD changed that at all. Yeah, um, I think like, so my current employer lets us run our own uh, devices. And kind of the interesting thing as they build out this type of capability is uh, depending on the device, you get different levels of access. Mm. Um, so especially on like mobile devices, um, Apple currently has probably the best platform for um, securing that device. And so we're very quickly saying like, you have to have an Apple device okay. in order to be on the network. Um, and even then you still have like some uh, a reduced amount of access uh, relative to say someone's like actual laptop. Um, yeah, which is that... kind of the thing I, that's one of the things I find interesting. So we have like, an entire chapter called like network agents and like that is our attempt at a term that captures this idea of what do you call the union of someone's device and uh, user and application. And we're, we're calling it an agent to try to echo like user agent. Mm. Um, but that's, that's kind of a key idea, right? Is like, you are not authorizing a user or a device. You are authorizing the network agent, which is all of those things put together at a particular point in time. And that's what you're making a policy decision against. Okay. Because I'd imagine, I'd imagine at a certain point you'd you'd have to do that, like say you you need to have Apple or something. Otherwise, you're going to be reconfiguring that that homegrown, uh, you know, system daily, you know, to deal with everything. Yep. Reconfiguring and in, in, in what way are you thinking? Um, just if it's a different kind of device. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they all have a different type of, you know, if they, if they're yeah. 
you know, a different OS is going to have different, uh, you know, c- capabilities or, uh, or or whatever you might have to take into consideration yeah. when they're connecting to whatever app or. One of the trends that we've been seeing is that um, in client facing zero trust systems, so systems which are uh, providing a service uh, to users in an office or in the field or, or otherwise, um, tend to heavily skew their interaction towards the browser, as a, towards like browser delivered uh, mm-hmm. apps. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is that you can configure the browser usually relatively trivially for mutual TLS. Um, so the problem is reduced to, you know, what, it, what how is strong is the crypto store on whatever device you've brought? Um, and how can I load a key into it? Um, and how can I configure your browser to speak mutual TLS? Um, and because that that gives you kind of the device authentication, so to speak. And and once they hit their web resource, you drag them through your regular IDP and multi-factor authentication, and you kind of get all those things uh, for free, essentially that device authentication underneath. Okay. Um, so so to, to alleviate that burden of like myriad of devices and, and, and different capabilities, um, most of the client-facing stuff is we see at least typically delivered to the browser. Which is happening a lot lately anyways. Yeah. You know, everything's a web app now. <laughs> yeah. So when you're uh, when you're mentioning um, your your third party thing like Mr. Betcher asked, you're you're basically relying on the CA model, right? Where a third party determines who gets trusted between the client and the server and how much trust each party gets. So I mean, can you have it where the client is completely trusted? But the server is not, and vice versa. Or, 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 or is it like a like a like an SSL connection where the highest possible trust is negotiated between the two, and that may not be like you get the keys to the kingdom. You may get like you know low level user access or something. Okay. I think that um, the the authorization is made largely up, uh, against the requester, uh, so. Um, it, it is usually an ingressing the service uh, that is the backend service, so to speak, at which mm-hmm. the authorization is done. Uh, it's usually done closer to the thing of which you're trying to protect and not the requester side. Right. Um, so, so oftentimes uh, when that relationship comes in, it's less so much like, hey, uh, is it going to the right resource? Uh, so much as it is, hey, what resource are you requesting? I know how to forward and handle that, but you must be authorized first. Okay. Um, so, but it is definitely um, everything has to be mutually authenticated because there's definitely kind of this. Well, if I don't authenticate the server, how do I know I'm not being man in the middle from Starbucks? Mm-hmm. And if I don't authenticate the client, how, you know, there are similar concerns there. Sure. Um, so Can I you- guess uh, I guess with with zero define uh, zero trust networking, your microservices become very important. Uh, using containers in this case, you don't you. That makes it a lot easier to, to manage these things because microservices only open certain ports, only allow certain protocols. Um, how, so let's say you're a Google, for instance. Mm-hmm. You must have hundreds of microservices or something running in the background that have to be load balanced. How does zero trust networking work with, say, a load balancer or, or, or a WAF or something that helps protect uh, these devices? I mean, if you're coming into... Uh, a website and you're just, you know, I'm just Joe average user visiting Google. That gives me what access I've got no certificate. I've got no authorization. I'm just a guy. How does that work with regard to load balancers with WAFs with, you know, SSL accelerators, those kinds of things like in regular infrastructure. Sure. So I think actually like the, the continuing shift towards like containerized applications is like kind of the sweet spot for this network model. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason it's the sweet spot is because those um, container schedulers have a source of truth that you can reference and start like rolling out credentials between um, two communicating systems. Um, so like in your load balancer example, what you're probably going to need is you're going to need either a load balancer that has like an API that you could have automation reconfigure or has some like plug-in point where you can actually put a, a check to make sure that you are load balancing to the right backend system. Mm. Um, so you Either P- one of those UPNP is getting sexy again, is what you're trying to <laughs> so say. So that's the interesting question, right? It's like this, you definitely don't want to go down the UPNP route. Um, so how do you build like trust in uh, the systems that want to expose a port yeah. um, to the internet without like just letting them go hog wild? Um, 
I think that's an interesting question. Like kind of the way I would try to tackle this. And I think a lot of companies do this is they try to tackle it from like a human process perspective and less so from like a technology perspective. Yeah. Um, so you might want to capture that this service wants to expose a port close to the service like definition, but you certainly don't want to let that like deployment of the service just unilaterally open up a port. Yeah. Right? So you probably send it by security, they approve it. And then it goes through some other like system that they have access to to actually go make the change on behalf of the service. But you can but the, the key difference here is like you have really great traceability that can be like automated and uh, you know automatically audited and make sure that it doesn't fall out of sync. But so to sorry, so to add on that just a little bit, um, you know, uh, oftentimes there's you know there, we we talk about you know client facing uh, zero trust networks what they look like we talk about data center zero trust networks what they look like and and there are different applications certainly and as a result the implementation is oftentimes uh, looks different and there can be a lot of confusion and how does it look, look like when you have this data flow which is coming from the client and flowing into the data center like how does it cross those boundaries and, mm -hmm. and how do you maintain that kind of secure relationship as the packets come from Starbucks into your data center across your routers and into backup services. Um, and the way that I like to look at that is, you know, you consider the load balancer, which is front end in your service is kind of part of the service. It is the entry point. Um, and between the load balancer and the client is one a secure relationship. And between the load balancer and the back end service is a different secure relationship. Um, so clients will terminate on the load balancer and the load balancer will make its own authorization decisions uh, through, as Doug said, either uh, inbound configuration or outbound calls uh, dynamically. Um, and then separately, there's a relationship which exists between the load balancer and the services it's forwarding to. Um, and you do you can do behavioral analytics on both of those sides, right? Is the load balancer acting kind of strange? Is the user acting kind of strange? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's actually a much, much more natural marriage than... than you would think that it is. Um, it, it simply, if you just bend your, you know, tilt your head in the right way and say, well, the, the load balancer is really kind of part of my service and the load balancer looking forward to the clients is that client facing bit, um, but looking back from the load balancer is kind of that server, that back end part, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the thing that gets me is that you, you, so you mentioned the client to the load balancer, so you got A to B, you got the load balancer to the server, which is B to C, but A to C doesn't necessarily equal a trust relationship. So you have to deal with that load balancer being the man in the middle, which could be a point of weakness and point of attack to, mm -hmm. to screw both ends of the, of the equation in this case, right? So the, usually in these kinds of deployments, the load balancer will, will do its authorizations at layer seven. Um, so that thing will be like an HTTP load balancer or, or something of, of the like and speak application protocol. And the, mm -hmm. the authorizations that go into the Zero Trust Network as a result of that are request-centric. Right? Um, from the load balancer back to the server, you, you can say, well, we've already done like a fair degree of authorization of this request itself as it entered the load balancer. And the relationship that you examine and trust between the load balancer and the backend service is more like, is this a trusted load balancer? Do I trust it to inject the right headers? Are the access patterns normal looking? Um, those kinds of things. So it does seem kind of uh, like like a way that something might be able to sneak in, but the reality is that um, unless the load balancer is owned, uh, you won't be able to inject. And if the load balancer is owned, then the behavioral characteristics between the load balancer and the backend services is something that might be able to be detected. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm a company, and I'm coming in, and I'm in employing Amanda's company as an MSSP. She's like, okay, great. Let's look at your architecture. And we're like, oh, yeah, we're doing zero trust networking. If I had a company that was that advanced <laughs> with their asset management and knowing what data is on their network, I don't know that I would really have that much of a job to do. <laughs> well, so that's that's my question. MSSPs use things like IDSs and IPSs to monitor network traffic. <laughs> how, does, how does a zero trust network allow you to monitor the network traffic uh, unless you're actually doing it on the host itself, which one, you're running into resource issues, especially using Amazon instances. You don't want every instance to be running a local IPS or IDS. You know, uh, wh you know how, how do you how do you how do you monitor the traffic between that? Are you using some kind? And you mentioned setting up secure tra you know connections between that. That means SSL decryption. So you're look you're going to have to decrypt the SSL between that. You know, I'm looking at performance issues all over the place here with this. 
Yep. You want me to take? You want me yeah. to take? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, the short of it is absolute, absolutely you're right. Um, and IPS IDS is going to take a hit, you know, um, and, and that's kind of the point. Like, you, 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 you are protecting against things like IDS and IPS, you know, maybe in this case, uh, uh, you want that thing to be there, but, but those are exactly the kinds of, the kinds of intruders that, that you're looking to mitigate. Um, so, so yeah, you're going to take a hit. And I think that, um, you know, the, the right approach in, in this case is, uh, it's hard to really say because, you know, I haven't worked on it myself, but I've spoken to people who have worked on these kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and the general, the general accepted approach is you do like a slow instrumentation throughout the network. And then you do anomaly detection on the flow results. And uh, you basically try and do your best attempt at correlating these flows and say, well, this flow is from this service to this service, this service to this service. Um, what's the connection rate? What's the volume? What's this? What's that? Um, and then uh, anomalies that occur within that thing, you can then go and say, okay, well, this is something that we didn't expect. Um, but also, you know, I think that the need for IDS IPS, like embedded in mind in the network, is also quite a bit reduced because there's no longer like, oh, that thing that you didn't expect is squeaking out. Because if you didn't expect it, there's not going to be a policy for it. It's not going to get routed anywhere in this. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's more kind of like, hey, we know everything that is there we actually expect. Um, and it's more um, kind of uh, vague properties of those connections, like I said, connection rate and throughput and things like that, that, that you might be able to pick on, up on. But your uh, things like IDS and IPS are certainly a lot more limited in this architecture because you lose all that deep packet inspection and things sure. that, that you might be accustomed to in the traditional model. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> No, I, that that makes perfect sense. Um, the the only other st thought I was asking about, um, I, I'm learning how to do Docker and those kinds of things, and I I found this interesting idea that when you're when you send up a bunch of containers, you don't even have to have an IP address necessarily or an, a, a networking like a, a subnet. You can call it Network Bob, and everything can be connected to Network Bob or Network Alice, and um, that really doesn't work well for like IPv4 based stuff. I mean, there's an IP address, yes, but uh, network Bob is different than 192.168.0.1 or whatever like that. Um, how do we, how, is there some kind of network translation that goes on, you know, cause I'm coming from an outside network with an IP address. Where does the network translation occur? If you're using a bunch of containers with network Alice trying to get into that, where, where at what point does that happen on a zero trust network? So uh, I think like the zero trust networks largely aim to avoid those kinds of complexities. Um, God, I hope you know, so. well, well, yeah. <laughs> what we want is, you know, Alice should talk to Bob. You shouldn't have to know what freaking network. Well, you shouldn't have to know any of those things, right? right? You should be able to write a policy that says Alice can talk to Bob, and here's how they can do it, and that's the end of the story, right? Um, and that's kind of the the model that we're driving towards. You know, um, we want things to be able to work without having to understand what the underlying network topology is, without worrying about if there's an act in between these these instances or not. Right? Um, what it, what what the access should really come down to is cryptographic relationships. Sure. Um, and so, you know, you, you you root cryptographic identity in the device. You root cryptographic identity into the application, um, and the packets when they come in, they're they're if you do have any policy, which is like only from this IP address, it's very small and fleeting. You, you really don't rely on that as your primary mechanism. Mm -hmm. What you rely on is, did this was this packet signed by an entity which is authorized to access me in this way? You know, sure. um, was it signed by my CA uh, if you're using X509 or, or, or things like that? So, so that is a, a big deal, you know. And, and particularly me as a network engineer, you know, I, there are lots of nasty complexities that come in, in network architecture and topology. And, and the last thing you want to do as an application owner is deal with those things or have to even understand them, you know. Um, so I think that's one of the main advantages of zero trust networks is that look, like we understand those complexities that exist. You should not have to understand them. What you know is that thing over there should be talking to me, and I can tell you a little bit about that thing and make the rest of it work. And that's where that all, all that fancy automation comes into play. And I think, like, to put this in, like, concrete terms, right? So this is something that Evan and I did, right? We were constructing our network and um, actually, like, building enforcement systems. We had a system where you had the exact same policy if a network that's behind one layer of NAT is talking to a network without NAT and the same policy for NATed network to another NATed network. And the automation is able to just interrogate how those relationships are going to route and, you know, configure it the right way. Yeah. And that's like the value of that, right? Like, because you're not defining your policy in terms of implementation details, you can you know, reuse it in a lot of different ways yeah. and capture some of this complexity elsewhere where it's best dealt with and not like down in the weeds of, you know, defining policy. 
Okay. Can you implement this with a, um, let's say all you get to have is a PFSense router. I mean, is that possible? I don't think so. Um, it, it, it's very, very hard to envision this being effectively implemented without endpoint instrumentation. Mm. Um, so it, Which the, is the why whole, you mentioned IP tables on exactly, the endpoint, right? Yeah, okay. Exactly. And, and that, that's kind of the place where you start. It doesn't mean that you can't have PFSense in your, in your network. You can have your PFSense in your network so long as it's plugged into this automation framework and updates automatically. Um, so, so it, it's kind of, you want to start on the host implementation and, and, the, and the host enforcement because that's where you're going to inject identity. That's where all these other things are going to come. As soon as you start uh, putting the enforcement further away from the thing you're trying to protect, that's where uh, you have room for, for lateral movement and other things to squeeze in. Um, so Zero Trust Network Advocates started exactly the thing you're protecting, that host that is serving that protected resource, instrument that. And then once that's instrumented, you can start moving out further into the net. So you're setting this up, and this is a this is a grand project of your of your of your C level folks. How do you do? How do you transition properly? Because obviously there's going to be uh, some method by which you have like a couple of hosts that you're going to be connecting to, and you're slowly going to be transferring everything over to to the zero trust model. Um, how do how do you do like crypto negotiations? You know, how do you push out the um, uh, the the certificates needed to do this uh, in in our talk with Jason Garbus uh, a couple of weeks ago he mentioned that uh, Z, you know software defined perimeter uses like port knocking type uh, functions to you know send the the token in this case um, mm-hmm. how do you how do you get all that implemented and then still have your your traditional network I mean are you are you running everything over SSL tunnels or HTTPS tunnels to to be able to do the initial you know and then as you're moving away from that and you go okay this week the mail server is going to be sitting in its own little island and then next week it's going to be you know the file servers and such and, and how do you isolate that in a in an environment I don't want my file server being accessible necessarily outside of the network i mean are there any additional protections you can put in just you know to keep china from banging on my file server sure i mean i think the the key things you need to to get started is going to be some definition somewhere of who should be communicating with each other and so you need to start building up that database Mm -hmm. um And if it's like a brownfield network, that might just be a whole lot of like network monitoring to try to discover flows and categorizing them and tying them back to service. Um, I think the other interesting thing we didn't talk about before, but like the CA aspect here, a lot of companies end up standing up their own private CA. Okay. And they use that instead of a public CA. And it's simply because they want to have like very tight controls around who can actually create short-lived credentials. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the keys, uh, like key points that we try to hit in the Zero Trust Network is to provide the security as an infrastructure layer. Um, so we, we very much look to remove um, all the security consciousness, you know, um, necessarily, you know, not, not to the detriment of the application. But, but for instance, like the application shouldn't have to worry about loading a TLS library and how to configure it. Right. Right. Um, especially in microservices, as you mentioned earlier, this can get very messy, especially with lots of teams and lots of services, different languages, which ones implement how to list this way, that way. Um, what is the right configuration? How do you manage all those things? Yep. Um, so, so one of the key design aspects is, you know, like the application should not have to, to worry about that thing, right? That should be offloaded as an infrastructure concern where we can give, we can give predictable performance characteristics and predictable variable modes. Um, is, a, is a distinct advantage. So, so how I, I actually do do that, you know, um, and, and and you know, kind of mo- like most of the questions that Zero Trust comes back to automation. Um, if you want to use TLS in the data center to do this, um, you need to wire all those relationships up and inject the certs and do all this stuff. Lyft's Envoy attempts to do some of this stuff for you automatically, and, and is an attractive solution. However, as TCP only is TLS. Mm. Um, Doug and I went down the path of using IPsec uh, to build kind of a host-to-host uh, mesh network, if you will, that was opportunistic, which would turn up whenever a connection was requested. 
Um, and the advantage of this is that um, the cryptographic relationship exists at layer three. So no matter what protocol you're running, it's going to go over there. And uh, you can uh, you can carve the kernel policy in a way that it says, look, if you, you do not emit a packet which is not encrypted. It's either you're either speaking IKE or you're sending a, a basic packet, that's it. Um, so this is a very attractive way so to, to um, kind of deploy the security underneath the app running applications and, and brownfield scenario, right? Um, the way that we did it is IPsec has a few different modes that it can run in. Um, one is none. One is like, I can't remember the name. What was it? Opportunistic or, or, or something Aggressive. Like yeah. And, and then one is required. And I think it was like, there, there, there's one where it's like, you, you will not try to negotiate. You will try to negotiate. But if you don't successfully negotiate, you fall back to plain text. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you will try to negotiate. And if you fail, then you fail and nothing goes. Um, and the way that we rolled it out was we said, you know, we'll start over here with a service um, and you ratchet up those things to say like, okay, rather than none, we'll say like opportunistic, right? Um, and then you ratchet up as neighbor to say opportunistic and then you form that relationship. And then you kind of slowly roll it out across the infrastructure um, in a way that doesn't disrupt the, the flow that exists today, um, but also can kind of capture and scoop up all that traffic that would have been pretty disruptive to, to tweak otherwise. So, yeah, I think that might be what cool. you're asking. Yeah. So <clears throat> with this new network, are, are there any requirements like, uh, you know, I'm a government agency and I run XP. Is XP, <sighs> could, you, could you run a zero to, you know, zero trust network on, on an old, uh, you know, two, four kernel or, uh, you know, uh, a Windows XP box? Is that, is that even possible? I would say you could probably let it join the network, but it would have very little trust in the network. And so probably wouldn't gain, get access to a very sensitive resources. Well, you know, there's the always reality. that one box out there that does That's the true, thing yeah. that we don't want it to break. Yep. And, you know, it runs Windows XP service pack zero and we need <laughs> it to not, you know, do I, that. I mean, these, these things are, are, are like we said, they, there's not really any off the shelf solution. So how much trust do you grant in any particular thing that's large for your own call? Right. Uh, if you want to put an exception in there, uh, that's that's your prerogative. You know, um, I, I can say that XP does speak IPsec and, and can speak TLS2. Um, you know, that's the nice thing about using these mature protocols is that they're very widely implemented. Um, one of the things that Doug and I found out, neither Doug or I are Windows experts, but one of the interesting things that we found uh, in writing the book is that Windows, the Microsoft platform at large, is actually um, uh, pretty well positioned to implement zero trust because of the group policy and active directory controls. Sure. And um, Windows, Windows comes with um, IPsec uh, configuration points for group policy. So you can, you know, uh, push these kinds of policies out in a way, and then they come with the, you know, domain joined hosts have certificates and everything. So, so they're they're actually fairly well positioned uh, to to roll this out without a whole lot of overhead. Um, I just can't say that I've I've done it, but they they do look, you know, like promising. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I have a I have a software defined network, and I'm trying to connect to another company's software defined network. Uh, if you guys don't have the same requirements and it's been balkanized you roll your own they roll their own uh what happens uh so i think this this really depends on on you know the access policy of organization a or b um when you talk about client access what you're authenticating is you're authenticating the the client device and the user um, the client device, if, if it's backed by X509, uh, trust can be chained. So you have an opportunity to do federation through like regular CA trust, okay. where you can say, hey, clients for an organization X should be able to access my thing. I will interrogate their client device the same way as I do mine, um, except I will also allow them to, to have a cert which is signed by organization. Whatever. Okay. And, well, then, and then you, the same, same kind of IDP relationships too, you can drag them through whatever... Um, identity provider uh, uh, they they use in that company. Well, I was just wondering because uh, you know I know the uh, Jason and them are trying to set some kind of base uh, standard. You know, obviously there's going to be add-ons and and stuff, but um, you know, it, as long as you're following a, a baseline, then everybody should be able to contact one another. We're not talking like you know crazy you know balkanized you know where everybody's well, bob talking a different needs language. to talk to bizarro bob on the at the other company and work something out yeah, right yeah yeah i think honestly there's like 
that's where a lot of opportunity is. And one of the things we try to highlight in the book is that this is all very new, right? We don't have like all the answers, but we can certainly point people and say like, look, if like someone could get a standard here or build an open source project that builds on these ideas and gets people excited, that's a great opportunity to, to have some real impact in the industry. If only yeah. I knew a couple of guys who knew this stuff and I could start a company and make a Brazilian dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Doug. <laughs> well, Evan, you said you do this full time. How does that work? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, up till now, it's really just been pushing the book out. I, I think we mentioned <laughs> earlier that, that today is kind of uh, we've, we've turned over the majority of the text. So um, I'm trying to focus my time. You know, my, my, my mission uh, in life really right now is like, hey, uh, I think this is really right. Um, I'd like to see the world use it. What are the various entry? Clearly, one of them is well. It takes a long time to build, and it's hard, and you need smart people to do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, writing the book was the first step in, in trying to kind of espouse this thing and get it out there and see some adoption. Um, we're gonna do, you know, a book launch. We're gonna do some conference talks. We're gonna do some stuff like that. Cool. Uh, but you know, if if the needle doesn't move as much as we think it will, you know, maybe we work on some open source software. Um, you know, some reference implementations. And some guidance to people who want to get their hands dirty, we can maybe provide some code. And, and so I, I'm still, we're still trying to kind of work out that future right now. Um, please, like, if anyone is interested in hacking on some code, just feel free to reach out to us. I'm happy to hear from you. I'm still thinking about the PF Sense thing. Like, if you have layers mm -hmm. and zero uh, east west movement, right? But everything has to go through the router and no, no single node can talk directly to the other node. Um, because they have their own firewalls uh, on board. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that could work, but you know, I'd have to read the book first to see exactly yeah. what you guys are defining as a zero trust network. And I would say that it, it, it could work like that. And, and um, you know, some of the, one of the first people to kind of espouse this, this um, architecture is this forester guy named John Kinderfog. And his, he originally posted kind of, you know, a, a reference architecture, which included um, something similar to what you're talking about, um, where you would still have the centralized firewall. However, very, very tight relationship between that device and the endpoints that it's protecting maybe even yeah. like a direct connection, you know, um, and then just like unilateral uh, policy enforcement through that device. So, so that, that those architectures haven't spoken about it. And I think that in some ways you might be able to achieve the architecture through that kind of model. Um, though, you know, Doug and I have discussed this at some point and it's almost like, man, it, it's like, wouldn't it be cool if there was a little puck that I could just plug into my RJ45 jack that came with a crypto identity that I could like tie in my device inventory and say, I just plugged this thing into, you know, asset X, right? CA on a stick. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's very similar to like the YubiKeys that people are mm -hmm. deploying. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Point. Yeah. UB, uh, USB licenses like for Pro Tools or whatever just comes in a USB key. So yeah. And it's like a RJ45 sheath that just implements all the crypto algorithms and, and does the thing. Right. So, 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 but that, that is kind of like the way we're thinking, right? And certainly it might be able to be done given the right, um, the right uh, inter switch architecture and things like that. Uh -huh. the, yeah, yeah. Sounds, yeah. What language are you guys using there? You, you're, one of you said you're a reformed Java user or dev. So, I mean, what are you using now, like Python or, uh, uh, you know, so I've Ruby? done most of my development in Ruby, Ruby. Um, for quite the past few years. I've been dabbling a little bit in Go. Um, if I were to write something zero trust, I probably would look at something like Rust. It seems to be like Rust. the thing that people are interested in lately because of the. Uh, just the type safety guarantees and therefore you have fewer chances for kind of obvious bugs. Sure. And when I, the, I left PagerDuty a few months ago and I left, we were writing in Ruby and Golang uh, for zero trust purposes. Right. Um, we were writing in Golang uh, where required and where the, where things were needed to be more mature and writing in Ruby for fast prototyping okay. um, of components that we just wanted to kind of get out there and see, see how they worked. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's largely open. I mean, it's whatever works for you, whatever interfaces you, you need to consume in order to get that enforcement job done. Do y'all have a GitHub or anything? Because we can put it in the show notes if uh, you want people to poke around with it. Uh, actually, those, that's all of the stuff I was working on. It unfortunately has not been released. Probably but, uh, OIP. IP. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. <clears throat> all right. Um, Ms. Amanda, Mr. Betcher, I have one more question, but I've been hogging the conversation. So uh, do either of you have any more questions before I ask my last question? No, I'm good. I'm just looking up Rust. 
It's a. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> What? No, it says no, no, it's, it's blazingly cool. fast. Well, it has to be blazingly fast. I'd imagine you'd have latency issues if you didn't trying to, you know, run it through, you know, you know, if you're running Perl or something, you know, which has got awful slow. So, all right. My last question is because this is kind of an InfoSec podcast. Uh, I don't know how you guys do with your security side, but if I was a pen tester, what would be the attack surface that I would look at first if I'm poking around on your zero, uh, zero trust network? Because it seems to me... Owning the client would be the best way to do it because they got all the keys over there. They got all the tokens, depending on how you do authentication. If you're using passwords, which, you know, winter, winter 2017 is probably what I'm using for my password. I have now access to your entire network. The CA, I think. You go after the CA. CA seems like a very important threat. Uh, yeah. Something to protect. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, endpoints are attractive. CA is attractive. Um, uh, CICD systems are super attractive for someone that's trying to attack it out. CIC? CICD, like, a, you know, uh, continuous integration, like a Jenkins build server or something. Right. Um, that's yeah. one that people are often very sensitive about. Mm-hmm. It's just the opportunity for remote code um, execution via getting into that pipeline. Yeah, yeah. deployment yeah. services. Yeah. I think, like, uh, one of the big things that, that gets me always is, you know, how do you authenticate the device properly? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the right way to do it is to bury the key in hardware, either with a YubiKey or, or TPM or something like that. Um, but it, it's it's rarely deployed in that way. And so, um, you know, for me, if I was attacking such a system, it would be like, hey, like, did you really secure that device key well enough? Like, if I own the device, um, can I lift the key off of it, you know? Yeah. Or perhaps even an online attack where I own the device and you're online and I ask the TPM to sign something for me or something along those lines, right? Yeah. So I, I think that's probably the, the weakest point, though it is certainly um, a large step above what people are doing today. Um, and a good friend of ours, Pat Cable, over at ThreatStack, you know, you know, kind of nudged us friendly and he said, look, you know, security is about outrun outlast. And I think that's what this is here, right? It's sure. like, how can we make this difficult enough that it's it's really hard? And, you know, that's kind of the best we can do. Um, so that that device key, I think, is, is a pretty crucial kind of linchpin in, in the whole model. And not not to mention kind of the, the security of all of the backend services, which are going to be making these authorization decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, naturally, those, those are all sensitive systems. I, w- I would imagine any kind of bandwidth... Uh... Uh, starving like DDoS or something against the CA would be uh, would be a very effective attack as well because if if you can't authenticate anything against the other boxes yeah. then you've basically brought down the entire network internal and external because everybody's using the same CA so well, yeah, absolutely um, this is a big vector that I kind of see in software defined perimeters is you know you 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 can hide the controller behind port knocking yeah. and you can do some things to prevent it from being discovered but if I can saturate the link I can saturate the link. Yep. Um, so, so definitely. In fact, um, I, I, I'm actually really pleased that you asked this question because we, our, our very last chapter in our book is called the adversarial view, in which we we try to take this approach and say like, okay, like where is the best place to get in? You know? Okay. Um, and, and there is a section on DDoS and there is a section on identity theft, and yeah, absolutely, like these things are, are concerns, um, and and you want to pay special attention to them. However, you know, it, it should not be thought that, oh, because you have these concerns, this thing must not, you know, it's like, well, we have these concerns, but it's still like a whole lot better than what you see normally today. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I mean, I mean, this isn't going to be any technology that's going to get rid of DDoSs or anything like that. I mean, um, well, I mean, can it get rid of DDoSs? Because a lot of them are like DNS amplification. You've got IoT issues. I mean, if you're setting up software to find network, wouldn't the trust relationship kind of make sure that you're not sending out unauthorized connections to to a host that you wouldn't normally touch? But I'd say on like the DDoS front, the nice thing about this model is um, your intention is captured away from how you implement it. So you can like scale out like uh, defense or enforcement systems, right? Or heavily isolate them. Mm-hmm. And because it's all just software configuring that stuff, it's really no more difficult for you as an operator to run like a front end for every single service if you want to do that. Yeah. It's expensive, but you know, it's it's a it's doable and you're getting to leverage all the work you already did. It's not something that you have to like blow it up and redo again. I think you brought up an interesting point too is is that when you talk about DDoS, it, you know, you have two is most people think of it as the receiving side, but there's also a sending side. Yeah. Um, I think in the Zero Trust Network definitely uh, 
as the sender of an attack, uh, you can you can start to reason about that might just be stopped in this tracks because if it's not something you'd be normally talking to, there won't be policy for it. But there's not policy for it, it doesn't get routed. Um, so so the sender side is as simple as that. On the receiver side, you know, it's harder to stop the deluge of packets, right? And, and one of the nice things about zero trust is that because you have all this policy codified in a way that can be like calculated, computer crunched, and, and, and distributed throughout the network, you have this opportunity to install kind of like really, really lightweight stateless scrubbers way upstream, you know, mm-hmm. um, which are just looking at basic basic uh, um, uh, rule sets that, that might be calculated from the, the policy which you have. Right. Um, so, you know, we're not talking quite the complexity of, of perimeter firewalls where you might have like state replication and fault tolerance and stuff like that. We're talking more just kind of like lightweight packet matching. Um, but but you, you have that opportunity to kind of stop them earlier on, uh, though you still have an uplink to that system and so on and so forth. So, so you know, from internet sources coming in, you, you still deal with those challenges. But there, there are some kind of nice tricks and, and, and that are opened up as a result of the architecture. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, um, as, well, I guess you just heard it. Doug and Evan are going to solve all the DDoS issues in the world. So uh, <laughs> I'll get started on that. We're expecting uh, big things in the next month or so. So uh, no pressure. No pressure. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, yeah, um, I've learned a lot. I don't know about Mr. Betcher and, and, and Ms. Berlin, yeah. but uh, this is something that's kind of been weighing on me. I've been trying to learn it because uh, it, it's coming, especially if you're any kind of startup or, you know, emerging company and, you're, you're basically in the cloud. So, um, uh, you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you guys came on the show. Uh, I'll have to thank Mr. Nick G when I see him next time, uh, to, to, for, you know, suggesting you guys come on the show. Uh, Doug, Evan, how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to discuss more about this? I mean, for me, you can hit me up on Twitter, just Doug Barth. Doug Barth, okay. Doug Barth, I'm on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn. I'm Evan two six four five. A little more complicated. Evan two six four five. Yeah, right. but if you hit up like the O'Reilly page for the book, um, I think our, our Twitter information is there, and um, okay, should be should be relatively easy to contact. Yeah, okay. we're happy to hear from anyone who's interested. Honestly, yeah, so we're we're pretty nice guys. I think if you're if you're looking for <laughs> potential employees for your yeah your anyone who yeah anyone who wants to work on it let's, yeah let us know absolutely if y'all are needing some VC money you know find you know <laughs> yeah you do you want. have any of that <laughs> uh, my daughter's got a piggy bank Is that cute? <laughs> I don't even have that <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah uh, if, go ahead say so if, if if nobody's told you yet you don't really make a whole lot writing <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah, yeah. We, we didn't expect to <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. So, um, are you guys going to be talking anywhere? You mentioned you wanted to put this out on the con circuit. Are you going to be doing any <laughs> development cons? I know DevOps days was up here in Seattle a few days ago, but, uh, are you guys going to be at a security conference or anything? Uh, so right now, like the next one we're definitely speaking at is Velocity in Santa Clara. Right. It's in June. Yeah. Um, there's, we put out a few, uh, proposals at other, like more security focused conferences. So we'll see cool. and find out. Hoping to be at more. Derby Follow comes us on Twitter uh, and we'll, we'll announce when we're speaking. We we expect to be accepted in a few more. We're just we don't want to prematurely. Nice. Well, Derby. See. If you haven't done DerbyCon, they're uh, they're available until like July first. So if you guys want to go to okay. Louisville, Kentucky, you know they'll. People would love to hear this stuff because I'm sure there's not a lot of folks out there doing it, and oh, yeah. there'd be plenty of people picking your brain about how to attack. I mean, uh, how to operate this in a proper <laughs> environment. Yeah, we'd love to speak there and drink some of their bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> you will not have problems finding bourbon there. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, we tell everybody who comes on the show, but, uh, you know, if you guys ever want to come back on and discuss any other facets of software defined networking, if you want to do a deep dive into, you know, the hashing algorithms or, or you know, data flow or, you know, how you would design your ideal network, please feel free to join us because, uh, you know, we, we love spreading the knowledge of, of new technologies like this. So that we, we awesome. appreciate Thank it. you. Right on. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ms. Berlin, you know, you've, you've been very noisy and hardly was, I was able to get a word in edgewise. How would people go about finding you if they wanted to, you know, discuss your own book? Um, on Twitter. Oh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and you are at 
<laughs> I am uh, info sister. I am F O S Y S T I R. Why did that feel? I like... forgot because I kind of forgot it. <laughs> you kind of forgot it. <laughs> yeah, it's something. Yeah, yeah. It's like Sorry. pulling teeth, man. Jeez. All right. Sorry. That's okay. God. Mr. Betcher, if people wanted to discuss uh, malware and such with you, how would they go about doing so? Yeah, hit me up on the Slack channel or at okay. Betcher Pwned on Twitter. I also have a website, log-md.com. Right on. Uh, Ms. Berlin, you mentioned the Slack channel. How would people get a hold of us on the Slack channel if they were doing that? I'm trying to it, spread out the uh, the end. Yeah, part yeah. I keep Because this I keep forgetting, too, is the sign up. It's us. Uh, what is it? Sign up. Dot- Shit, I don't remember now. I have, <laughs> I have it as a link somewhere. It's uh, breaksec.signup.team. Oh, it's in there your favorite. Is that it? Yes, yes. breaksec.signup.team. Yes. And yes. Sorry, it's late. I'm tired. It's okay. It's we have a very day. vibrant community there. Um, and we do. Uh, Tuesday nights, we do our CTF club, which uh, you know we're, we're working through slowly. Uh, Thursday nights, we have our Python class with, uh, with Matt, our instructor. Uh, that's going well. Um, and uh, we also are doing our book club on Sunday afternoons with with Miss Amanda. She's doing the security, uh, you know, defensive security handbook uh, with uh, with people in our in our book club. Yeah, there. the last one we almost we almost filled up the Google Hangout. I need I need you to change it to Zoom because okay, we yeah. had like ten or more people in a Hangout and yeah. you can't come on anymore. So the Zoom yeah. does fifty, so we should have plenty of people uh, if we do the Zoom. So yeah, it was it was. <laughs> Pretty nice last time. Cool. Well, maybe we can do the uh, Zero Trust Networking book at some point in the future and have yeah. uh, Evan and Doug join us uh, for, you know, for that. So Absolutely. Might be something to do. Uh, if people are interested in the Zero Trust Networking book, you can find the link uh, at uh, at shoporeilly.com. Search for Zero Trust Networking. Or if you just go to our show notes, there's a link in the show notes. Um, <clears throat> you can find me at Brian Brake on Twitter, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. Um, uh, I'm also on, on Slack quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I moderate that and keep the, keep the inmates in line and herd all the cats. And, um, you do a very good job too. Yeah. Move it to random people. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how many times have I read that? Like, yeah. All the well, time. You know really? what? I have to and be the potty. the time it's my fault. I have to be the potty pooper. I have to put them in, put them in random. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, we're also got a job board. We do the CTF stuff. Um, and, uh, our official Twitter is at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. And that's all I've got. We, you know, we're everywhere. iTunes, Android, Google Play Store, uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio app, um, SoundCloud. There's pretty much nowhere you can't find us. We have a YouTube channel. So you can check all the links in our show notes for locations on how to get to that RSS feed. BreakingSecurity.com is our website. So um, that was it for this week on Breaking Down Security. Uh, this show will go out probably the week that I'm at San Security West in San Diego. So if you guys are downloading this and you are in San Diego... Please come and see me at the Grant Manchester Grand Hyatt. I will be there doing Sec 504 uh, incident handling with Mr. John Strand. Uh, love to meet you. So please come by the hotel, or uh, if you're attending San Security West, please please hook, hook up and uh, we'll come say hello because uh, I'd love to meet you. So that was it for breaking down security this week. Have a great week, and we will talk to you again soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And we're clear. Oh my goodness, that was an awesome show. Oh, yeah, it was. I love that I hope, I hope so it was much. For you guys. No, that was such good nice. times, man. Hey. I love learning that stuff. Awesome. And I would just wish that Amanda would shut up and let us answer, ask you questions. Know what? I know. I I love you, man. I love you, man. I know it's late there. I'm sorry. It's um, past my bedtime. It, yes, yeah. it, we're really really excited about it. Obviously, it's a hard topic because there's so such little work has been done there. No, know? I agree. And that's, what we're looking forward to is like, man, like let's get some other people on board with this yep. book. Let's 
that's good in front of some people is gain some interest. Let's let's really kind of you know try and yep. get this stuff better. <clears throat> well, I worry about people like MSSPs and and pen test companies that you know they're going to do an engagement or something. They'll be like, oh yeah, we have you know software defined perimeter. Or, you know we have zero trust networking, and they're going to be like, we can't really cover you. Because what does an MSSP do? They put in HIPS, they put in IDS, they monitor HIPS, they monitor IDS. You know, they may monitor NetFlow at the firewall, but there's no firewall, there's no IDS, there's no IPS. Yeah. So unless you're doing well, it per host, you're screwed. That's another thing. Like, does that um, do any of the the uh, homegrown zero trust network things mon- um, log anything? Yeah, what's the yeah, logging but- like? Like the, the logging is actually a really cool story because because there are so many authorization checks and authentication checks that occur within a particular flow or request, every single one of those interactions is something that you can throw off events and logging uh, mm. type stuff for. So you actually get a really, really uh, a great insight into the activity on the network because um, you, you have all this rigorous checks going on all the way through the system. And you um, can, so, so while you lose this deep packet visibility from some of the stuff that we, we traditionally see deployed today, um, you, you gain all this other visibility, right? And then that visibility that you gain is stuff that you can then start to do the behavioral analysis on and all the other. Have you, have you ever thrown any of that logging into um, like a log aggregator or, or SIM or anything to see? I mean, like, so, so I, off of? I, we, we, like when I was at PagerDuty, we would log all this stuff and, and we would like watch those relationships churn over and try to correlate them. Usually it was more like correlate them with problems we thought we might be having. <laughs> um, but, but definitely like uh, they do produce some useful data. And I think like, you know, the deployment that we built at Zero Trust, I would say is 15 or 20% of what it could be um, in terms of the full Zero Trust vision. Um, so, so there's really a lot more to be done there and a lot of opportunity. And, and you know, it's just kind of like, not everyone, like, there's not really anyone who has done the full scope of the thing. Some people have done this bit, this bit, this bit. And so a lot of the work on writing the book has been, like, rallying everyone together in yeah. one place. Like, okay, guys, like, hey, right, we, right. we tried this, you know, what did you try? All right, so I, I got one more quick. Oh, God, I can't believe I didn't think of this question during the show. All oh, this is going to have to go on a, after the Do you have a credits. logging chapter? Is there a logging chapter? We don't have a chapter on it, but we do have like a, a section on like logging and disability in Zero Trust. And we talk kind of about like the different points in which these things can be hooked um, and, you know, go into a little bit more detail about it. But it, it's not um, it's not like super in depth, right? Okay. So I have a, I have a question. So when, when, a, when a user or a server talks to another server, they authenticate once. Do they have to authenticate again for every connection or is it just... A certain amount of time. How does that work? Um, I think it depends on your particular, like what you're looking to get out of it, you know. Um, and and because zero trust is just like, do you adhere to this model? Um, it doesn't. Really, it's not really prescriptive in that and exactly those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so you can you if if it generally is a function of where you place the enforcement. Um, so if the enforcement is placed at network layer, like layer three or layer four, um, generally it's like per like connection oriented. So like per TCP flow or per conversation. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, if you place that enforcement up at layer seven, an application layer, like in a load balancer or something, you're talking yeah. about literally every application request. Okay. Um, so it's a function of what you're looking for, um, how fast you can do those authorizations, what your performance requirements are. Yeah. Um, there, there's a whole lot of things. So that's kind of one of the one of the things about the book is it's very, very loose in some of these things because it really does depend on kind of what your own requirements are and, and your threat model and stuff. Well, the and, reason I and, asked was you mentioned the seam, you know, being able to input stuff into Splunk. That's massive amounts of constant connection back and forth, back and forth. I was just wondering, well, if they're going to have to negotiate every freaking time, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of bog down. And the other thing I was thinking was, well, with mass amounts of authorizations, are you going to leverage things like with the upcoming TLS 1.3 where they're using zero RTT where it's like, hey, I've already seen you once. I don't need to reauthenticate you by doing yet another handshake. We'll just do the two-step handshake and go on through. I was just thinking because I know Cloudflare and a lot of those are using that because it cuts down the amount of authentications like from 600 milliseconds down to like two, four to 200 seconds. So I was thinking, you know, if you're doing those kinds of mass authentications like that and, and, and connections, then that would you know, using zero RTT in those would, would, would behoove you to, to use, to leverage. I think one of the interesting things with, um, if you buy into like, say the sidecar model, right, where you make the uh, network security uh, infrastructure concern, mm-hmm. then you can, you can kind of get your cake and eat it too, because you could 
have this sidecar that's sitting out of process. Ideally, if you do like a containerized application, it's on the other side of the containers. And that thing can do um, authorization checks before like leveraging some pre-existing uh, network tunnel. Right. Right. And both sides could actually do um, kind of peered uh, authentication checks. Mm -hmm. So you can protect yourself a little bit against like one side being owned, while the other side could like, you know, check and make sure that this is still authorized. Yeah. It's, it's like double work, but it, you know, it protects like one class of attack. Okay. Uh, I think like another key realization too is like, the separation of authentication and authorization. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you describe like this, this high round trip over top, uh, overhead that is related to like cryptographic protocols is, is like a very big problem, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but that, that, that conversation there is the authentication of the client. It's not necessarily the authorization, but it is, it is like saying, okay, well, I think you are who you say you are. There's a separate check, which is, okay, now are you allowed to do what you're asking to do? Yeah. Um, so you can, th those authentication um, um, round trips can happen less frequently than the authorization does. Sure. Um, so for instance, if you're talking about, like I said, like a layer seven authorization check, of, like a HTTP load balancer, right? You might do only one TLS session, but every request that gets fired down that session is separately authorized right. um, by the load balancer, right? right? So you don't necessarily incur like any kind of round trip or communicative overhead. Um, it's more just kind of um, on the remote end that authorization process kicking off for every one of those requests you fire down. Nice. Time. Nice. Oh man, I'm so. Oh, this is this is why I always keep recording after this because you know this, <laughs> this stuff needs to go in the show because I'm sure there were people asking about the you know like that kind of thing. Yeah. So <sighs> you just cut and paste that in, or you put that on afterwards. I'll do it after the music. You know, like I normally do whenever somebody asks interesting questions post show. <laughs> <laughs> like I, you know, I do, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have all this ready to go before I go to Sands because I'm gonna be recording a lot of audio. Hopefully, at Sands uh, Security West. So, um, seriously though, you guys, you should definitely get a hold of like maybe RSA or go into DerbyCon or or a B sides or something at least to to talk about you know uh, the last chapter in your book or whatever at least to be able to you know because there will be people there that will poke you and will will go hey what about attacking this or have yeah. you thought about this and it will help make it more robust so besides las vegas and uh um, lisa yeah. have both invited us to speak so we didn't mention them by name because we we were submitting this week and like you're still going through approval process, but they, we were asked to apply. So we hope to speak at besides Las Vegas. Cool. Um, and we hope to be kind of hanging around Black Hat. Uh, we're we're nice. hoping to actually have the book printed. Uh, for that, for awesome. Offer shows. But yeah, so, so we are trying to do that and, and we'll check out Derby too. And, and yeah, please like keep your head up. If, if you know, spread the word, right? <laughs> like anyone, anyone like we're happy to chat. Let's sure. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll definitely, uh, pimp out the book and, uh, you know, cause now, now hers is out, so we don't have to, you know, do as much. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> No, no, that's awesome. Keep so, going. I, I need all my bills paid. <laughs> <laughs> Them college funds ain't going to pay themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, yeah, appreciate it, gentlemen. Um, I, yeah, if you ever, like we said, if you want to hit us up again to come on and, you know, talk about, you know, maybe you've made some innovations or some changes or, you know, something we talked about didn't work and you went another direction, we'd love to have you back on and, and, and discuss awesome. them. So, yeah, thank you very much yeah. for having us. All right. What What's the future like for, the um, old guard network engineer who doesn't want to innovate and, and, you know, like he's a, he's a Cisco firewall um, Kool-Aid drinker. I'm sure that shit will be around forever. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be government networks that are not going to do zero network. I mean, there's some that are afraid yeah, to go into the cloud. That's going to shrink right like so. a sun that went Nova. Right. I mean, I feel like the, you know, having come from that background, I, you know, one of the interesting things is I, I think that they're, they will be relatively safe. It's the, what it, the problem will, will come more in kind of like uh, compliance officers and security engineers who spend a lot of time manipulating firewall configurations and, and maintaining VPN uh, yeah. endpoints and those kinds of things that, that will yeah. see the most disruption. Yeah. Um, one of the things I like as a network engineer about this architecture is it says, hey, like the, this is your problem, Mr. System over there. Like This is not my problem. Yeah. Um, I'll shuffle the packets around and you figure your own stuff out. You know? um, so in some ways, it, it, it kind of makes the lives of network administrators easier in that they don't have to maintain all these really beefed up stateful boxes 
inside the network. Um, mm-hmm. cer- certainly, it opens adva- opportunities for like advanced SDN designs, where perhaps an application signals to the SDN fabric that it intends to make a connection and authenticate some is authorized, and then the route is installed. Yeah, um, this is something that we explore a little bit in our book, and we think is very interesting. Very cool. um, so, so there is a promising future for those things, but it doesn't necessarily preclude uh, the, the traditional network engineer. Nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. anything, it's like you get much clearer boundaries than what you might have today in your network. Like Evan and I were just talking about this, like, so a network engineer today is dealing primarily with packets, but they're also like got a little bit of security uh, enforcement. They have like some visibility enforcement. This kind of like resets the boundaries so that if you are just really interested in like pushing packets, like it's clear where, how you can push packets and the changes you can make in the network are, um, are much better like defined. Like obviously like you think about a, VM that Amazon gives you, they still have someone like, you know, setting up physical servers. And if they really like doing that, then they can do it. And they know what guarantees they're giving to downstream clients. And it's in Amazon's case, not very many. Um, so I mean, network engineer is free to renumber an entire section of the data center and right. know that the policy will be programmatically installed and defined. And I don't have to worry about like any of that stuff that you would normally worry about when you renumber uh, the section of the network. So there's a lot of nice things for network engineers that I, you know, find pleasing. Yes. Very cool. I I expect uh, Cisco or them to patent some of these, these, Pro, uh, the, the protocols and stuff in the very near future. Yeah. We're, we're, we're expecting, you know, Cisco junipers of the world to, (laughs) to raise some interest. Yeah. Yep. I can imagine. Yep. All right, gentlemen. Everyone have a good night. Um, Thank you very much again. Thank you. It's good talking to you guys. No problem. It was great talking to you too. Bye. Later. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.